I want to welcome all of you to uh, the new semester, those returning students as well as our new students. For the new students, it's the one time each semester that we get everybody together. Uh, we're going to do a uh, chef demonstration. We're going to make some announcements about events, culinary competition. We're going to give out some scholarships. And we're going to have a raffle as well. So we all have a raffle ticket. Did you do the raffle tickets? Right on. So um, I want to introduce Haley Matson Mathis. She's the executive director of the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation. The foundation. <laughs> the foundation is a nonprofit organization that supports culinary education statewide. So they not only host programs like this at all six of the culinary uh, programs statewide under the Uni University of Hawaii system, they also support 40 some high schools. So they partner 40 chefs with high schools and they've been doing a great job in that um, area. And they also support professional chefs, professional cooks in, in professional development opportunities. Uh, Haley. Chef Don serves on the Hawaii Culinary Education Foundation Advisory Board. And our whole mission, as some of you know, I've talked to you each semester, I recognize some familiar faces, is all of you. Um, the board works together and believes very passionately that you're the future of cuisine and food in Hawaii and the hospitality industry. That's why we put these programs on. Um, we are a nonprofit foundation and our mission is to bring these programs to your classrooms. And we couldn't do it without the generosity of chefs like Chai, who's with us today. And Chef Chai Chowrazuri is a amazing chef whose restaurant is located on Kapiolani Boulevard and in the Pacifica building. And it's a restaurant that not only serves outstanding cuisine, but it's just a beautiful ambiance, beautiful interior of the restaurant. And when you walk into the restaurant, you feel this um, wonderful feeling that comes over you because of the way that the restaurant's set up, the music and the hospitality, the graciousness and the food and the way that it's served by their staff. So really he has a long history in Hawaii and Hawaii regional cuisine and working with local farmers. And he's appeared on multiple television shows um, through the years. He served as a chef for Hawaiian Airlines. He's known really around the world, not just here in Hawaii for his beautiful cuisine and for his inventive cuisine. And we're very fortunate today to have a double bonus because we have Chai's sister with us today, Joy. And what a treat it is because they're going to expose you to some amazing, I'm sure you saw it come in, fruit carvings and vegetable carvings with the finest artistry um, and her skills were honed uh, in Thailand from one of the top, top, um, fruit carvers and vegetable carvers and it's truly an art form and that's one thing about Chai's food he never forgets the aesthetic of, of how delicious it must taste but the beauty of the food as it's presented on the plate he also runs a masterful catering operation and is recognized as some of the finest catering with weddings and the list of awards on this sheet that I gave you that he's received for his operation is impressive um, and it's recognized um, some of the beautiful wedding artistry if you don't follow him on um, social media be sure to check it out because he posts some of the beautiful things that they do for caterings and it's really artful it's beautiful presentation and plate presentation we have awesome program for you today and Chai's taken time from his very very busy schedule because one thing that uh, his work ethic and his graciousness is something that he brings to everything he does but he has an event tonight that he must be at but he's chosen to be with all of you today so i'm very very grateful and humbled to have with us today chef chai and joy thank you Haley. thank you very very much thank you. aloha everybody student teacher friends so it's an honor for me to be here today and share some of my passions some of my my recipes Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Because I'm only going to show you how to prepare one dish today. So what I, I want to show something that represents who I am. As a, I'm original from Bangkok, Thailand. I live in Hawaii about 35 years. My parents are Chinese. 
So I want to do something that represents both Thai and Chinese. And uh, for me, I encourage if you as a student or, or a professional chef, when you want to do something, you want to create your own signature. You want to create your own dish. You want to, you want to do something that represents who you are. You know, like one thing, if you go to my restaurant, many of the dishes that we serve, you don't find it any other restaurant. But if you, many times when you go to different restaurants, you see ahi poke, it's so many things that you can, you can find in so many other restaurants. So you have to ask yourself, why do I want to go to that restaurant to eat ahi poke when I go, can go to another restaurant that might be cheaper? And the quality of the fish might be better, but it's in a different ambient. But I want to do something that you can't find anywhere else. So today we're going to do a crispy whole fish with a Thai chili ginger sauce. And uh, this dish I serve on Hawaiian Airlines and also I'm going to be on uh, Beat Bobby Flair in November. So this one of the dish that I choose to, to serve. So, so the sauce is going to take a little bit some time, so I'm going to show you how to make the sauce before we go into the fish. So it's very simple. The key ingredient of this recipe is this called chili paste in oil. It's from Thailand. It's made of uh, roses, garlic, shallots, shrimp paste, lemongrass, ginger, galango. And, and other things. So it's half a little bit. Now, if you go to the store, you buy chili paste in oil from Thailand, they are different brand. So they have a little bit, a smaller one, smaller jar called Pantai Norising. That's a little bit spicier. This one a little bit sweeter. So if I use this one, I don't need to add sugar. If I use the other brand, they will add a little bit of sugar on it. So first we're gonna add with uh, some oil. Then I can do roasted garlic in the pan. I use, this recipe will be enough for everybody to sample, so I'm gonna make it all one time. So I'm gonna add the garlic and the shallots. Now, when you're cooking any sauce, you want to kind of sweat and get the aromatic of the, the, the herbs and spice to come out, so this one, I don't know in your side, you can smell the garlic coming out already. Because if you don't roast it, you just add in direct and then add the liquid. You don't get the full effect of the sauce, or of, of the flavor. Then we're gonna add chili paste in oil. One thing about this chili paste, is good the way it is. You can eat with rice, you can put, some to put on the toast. And it's very good. And then same thing, we want to roasting this chili paste a little bit. So I'm gonna cook it for not long because this is all cooked already and uh, the chili paste already roasted. They're roasting the chili pepper, they're roasting the garlic, the shallot. So we don't have to do much anymore. Then after about 30 seconds, it have the shrimp paste in there, so when you create the dish that you use the ingredient that you not make from scratch, you want to make sure you read the ingredients so you know if people with allergy or not, gluten-free or not. So in this one, have the shrimp paste in there. So you want to make sure that if somebody with a shellfish allergy is very important. Then you can add some chicken stock. Then I add uh, oyster sauce. So this is come from the Chinese side. And then we're gonna let the sauce simmer for about 15, 20 minutes. So why the sauce is heating, I'm gonna show, I'm gonna talk about the fish. Now you can use any kind of fish that you like. You can use opaka paga, onaga, Thai snapper. This one is Thai snapper. You can use moi. 
the word Thai snapper, these are not Thailand snapper, it's T-A-I, it's a Japanese uh, red snapper. So you want to make sure when you buy the fish, you want to clean, it's very good because a lot of time when you buy it, they clean it for you. They don't clean it that good. They always leave some of the scale on the top and inside still have some of the blood. That's one thing when you go to the restaurant, you can see that how good the chef is. It's all about the detail. So when you go, when I go to the restaurant and then I order a chicken wing and the chicken wings, they have feather on it. To me, it's so disgusting. And I see that all the time. And same thing as a fish, you want to make sure that you clean is really good. So then I'm going to dust with a little bit of flour. What flour does to the fish is when you fry it, if you don't, you go straight, you lose a lot of moisture. So the flour will kind of hold the moisture of the fish so your fish is nice and moist. Now, in my restaurant, we, like, like Haley said, when you eat, it's all about presentation. That's why one thing, you can use the same poke that you can buy from one restaurant for $10. And you can use the same poke, same fish, same ingredients, same cost, serving at Roy's. We can charge $20. But it's all about presentation and it's all about your reputation. That's why it's important for you to create your own image of who you are, who you want to be. So you, it, and it's nothing wrong if you want to be on the you know, reasonable side, it's nothing wrong with that at all. And then, in my restaurant, when we make this, I put a little bit of ginger in there. But later on, we're going to put a fresh ginger. So when, when, we, when I put a chunk one, I remove it later. And then I'm going to put the fish into the fry basket. You see, when you curl it like this, so however the shape of the fish, when you fry it, it will stay like that. And when you, when you fry anything, you want to make sure your oil is about 300 to 350 degrees. As you see, when I cooked the fish earlier, I did not seasoning at all. I didn't put salt, I didn't put pepper, because I'm going to season the fish Chinese style. So what I have here, this one is a, called Chinese thin soy sauce. It's similar to the, it make of soil. So it make from soy, so it's just, it's still not a gluten free, but Japanese soy sauce, they put a lot of seasoning in there to create that richness. This one is very much, just a light salt and soy. It doesn't have any other flavor in it. Then I put a little bit of a scotch or whiskey. Then this one is a green onion. I use a white part only and I smash it. Same thing, this one I put the ginger. We want to duplicate the flavor. So I put ginger in there. And I put a little bit of a black pepper. And this is the Szechuan peppercorn. So I roast it and I ground it. So if you don't have it, that's okay. You, you, can, you can work without it. And what, we, what you want to do, you want to kind of squeeze all the, get all the oil and the flavor of the ginger and the green onion. and extract all the flavor. And then we're gonna wait until the fish boiling, uh, uh, the fish is crispy. So I think my sauce is almost done. Like I say, every time when you do any cooking, especially when you, for me, you should always taste your food. Because for example, I use oyster sauce, different brand, it have different sodium, you know, some are more saltier, some more sweeter. So you always want to taste it.
pretty good. And from this sauce, that's why one thing about I do a lot of fusion in my in my cooking because to me it is why you want to limit yourself to Thai, to Chinese, to Japanese, or to French. So fusion to me is you use the best of all the world that offer you. And one thing to create fusion is if I do Euro Asian. As you know, in the French cooking, presentation is beautiful, right? And the food, very rich, lots of butter, lots of cream. Versus Asian, Asian have a lot of more like garlic, ginger, fresh flavor. So I got to combine the two sauces together. I'm going to use only half of this sauce. And all I do, I use the same sauce, and I add a little bit of uh, butter and heavy cream, it changed the flavor of the dish. I'm going to take all the ginger off first because this ginger are last pieces. So if you leave it on, if you serve it, somebody might bite into it. It's very peppery, it's very spicy. Now I think my fish is almost done, so I'm going to do the fish first. And with this, all I do is I'm just going to add a little bit more, more ginger. Now this one I shred it and rinse it because now you're going to serve it, you're going to eat this one too. So you want to make sure that you cut in a smaller pieces. And add a little bit of uh, jalapeno. It depends on how spicy you like it. So I add a few spoons. I like my food a little bit on the spicy side. And I add some green onion. Then the sauce on the first one is done already. So now I'm going to do the whole fish. Now in the hot pan, the reason we do this because you know that in the sauce that I have early, we have a whiskey in there, so we have alcohol. So I want to burn the alcohol off. So I put the, the liquid that I squeeze. So I have ginger, green onion, soy sauce. It's just like salt and the pepper, just like you do seasoning salt and pepper. And the steam from the fish it's kind of seasoning the, the, the fish by itself. Then I just have about a spoonful of the sauce on the bottom of the fish. And then. So this is the crispy whole snapper with chili ginger sauce. Now I'm going to show you that to finish up the other sauce. And then when you lay down, when you taste it, you can taste it side by side so you can tell the difference between the one with the butter, with the cream, and the one without it. Now, anybody have any question in the meantime why the sauce is still heating up? You, you can. The only thing is you have to be cautious. You know, the snapper is depend on the size of the fish. So when the fish is a little bit larger, you have to cook a little bit longer. And uh, okay, so. 
Somebody asked, can I use any kind of snapper? Yes, you can. You can use pretty much any whole fish that you want to do. The only thing is the size of the fish determines how long you have to fry it. And the bigger the fish, then you need a bigger wok or a bigger fryer. So for me, for this recipe, the fish should be larger than about three pounds. That's a perfect size. But of course, you can go any, any size. And, and you can use a, a, a trout, rainbow trout, or you can use pretty much any, any fish you want. Actually, at one time, I used a tilapia. Surprisingly, tilapia in Hawaii now is very, is, is much, people have a bad concept and think of tilapia as almost like a junk fish come from Alawai, come from somewhere bad. But, but now the, the tilapia that they farm raised in Hawaii is a different type, is they call, now we call sunfish because they, I think it's a different, it's not the black tilapia, it's the white one. So it's not as, the, it's not, fishy and it's very very good we use we serve it at the filipino food week at my restaurant and it was very very good so add a little bit of cream now i'm going to add a little bit of butter now when you add a butter into your food you want to make sure that you don't you have to keep stirring because otherwise your salt, your butter going to break so you're going to stir it until So when the, when the, the butter all melt, and this is, I use this sauce on my filet fish. I use it in my escargot at the restaurant. And that's why one thing, when people come to my restaurant, when they eat escargot, they say, wow, it's just different than anybody else, and nobody serves escargot the way we do. And that's what you want to do. You want to do something that nobody else does. So this will give you that, that edge that people are going to want to come and see you. So my presentation is done. Anybody have any question? Yes. The escargot you can you, well we buy it from the can already. They got uh, one from Indonesian and one from French. Indonesian one is cheaper. Texture and flavor very similar. You can't really tell the big difference. Versus in Hawaii, they have the, they call Hawaiian escargot or bokeh. But that's not because it's, it's a Hawaiian snail, it's fresh. So it's a little bit chewier, a little bit tougher. So it's totally, it's, it's, you can't do the same recipe. Anybody have any question? I, I grew up in the restaurant business. So since I was 10 years old, I went to the market with my mom. By I think 12 or 13 years old, I buy all the food from my restaurant. And in Thailand, a little bit different is in, in America, when you open a restaurant, you call your vendor, you call the wholesaler, and they deliver to you. In Asia, you have to go to the open market. You have to pick everything by yourself. So I will leave the house like 6 in the morning with my mom, and then we go grab and She's going to teach me everything, how to choose a fish, how to clean it. You know, like, like when you buy the fish, you want to make sure the eyes are clear, not cloudy, and it's still not slimy, no smell. So I learned a lot from her. And then uh, when I moved to Hawaii in 1985, I knew I want to open a restaurant, but I don't think I have enough knowledge or understand the market yet. So I work so many places. I work at Kentucky Fried Chicken. I work as a Chinese cook. I work as a waiter, bartender. Then I, you know, to me, to open a restaurant, you not, you can, if you know only front of the house, or only back, as a chef, if you only know back of the house and you don't know front of the house, so you end up have to partner with somebody else. When you partner with somebody else, it's always going to be a conflict, right? Because some are going to say, I work harder. The back of the house say, I work harder. So you always, for me, because I choose to open a restaurant, to me, it's my responsibility, it's my duty to learn what I want to do. So this way, in my restaurant, 
I never have to concern about any of my staff walking out on me and I'm going to be failed. I can be dishwasher, I can be cook, I can be bartender, I can wait on table, I did everything and I still can do everything. I know everything in my restaurant. Because that's when you know that whoever you partner with or whoever work for you or work with you, they will know that anyone is replaceable. And that's very important because that makes you the power that the restaurant is under my name, is who we are, it's not who they are, right? So I come from the country, I come from Thailand. When I first came, I hardly speak any English. I don't know anything about wine whatsoever. But it's my responsibility, if I can open a restaurant serving 100 different bottles of wine, I need to know why this grape different than that, this is what good with what food is my responsibility. Nobody going to teach me, nobody going to tell me I need to know. But if I open the restaurant without those knowledge, the chance that I'm going to fail is very high. So with the technology that you have, to me, any question you have, you can go online and Google it. Right? So you, you know the old days when I grew up, when, when we grew up, my mom would never share the recipe with anybody. Because this is your secret, this is your bread and butter. You don't share it. And that's an old style. The new technology is you share the recipe, but you're going to reach another 100,000. If some way, somehow, people are going to see what you do, and they're going to want to come to you. So it's a different mentality. That, but you, the, the bottom line, you've got to have a knowledge. And you have to know what you want to do and what, how, how you're going to move forward and make it success. And to me, you have to set a goal. Because when I first opened my restaurant, as a Thai, when I first opened, I opened Singha. It's a Thai restaurant. And uh, back then, the, the only Thai restaurant that I thought worth looking in is Kale's, right? So I always study my my friend, my competitor, I want to know why they do or how they do it and become success. So if they do the, and become success, if I do the same thing, I should get the same result. Plus, I'm going to add something that what I know that maybe they don't know. So that's how I do is it, I look at, so Kale was the best Thai restaurant before we opened. After I'd opened, we opened after about two years, then we won Hale Aina Best Thai Restaurant in Lima almost every year. I was on Harry Kitchen for the first time. I was uh, the guest that on his show the most. I was there 14 times. But after the first time, when the show finished, 15 minutes, my restaurant packed. They ordered the same three dishes that I make on the show. <laughs> so, Right there and then, I know already if I want to be success, or, or my goal is I want to have my own cooking show one day. So with any opportunity arise, when I go on his show, I learn how he do, because same thing, now I'm not just going to cook, I need to, I kind of co-produce, I want to know how the camera run, I want to know how the lighting, I asked I ask Michael May, he was like, he used to be produced my show. So I, I learned from everything. If I do a cooking show, I don't want to just show up and do my thing. I want to know how they light, why the lighting has to be behind me, some front of me, and, and chat. I want to learn everything because then that's how knowledge is power. And, and so I learned. So after I was on Harry Kitchen show, it was so good. So I, my, I set a goal. One day I want to have my own cooking show. And sure enough, I was lucky enough, I have my show on KGMB, KHON, seven years, and my cooking show was number one. So, um, and then also, like, same thing, right? You have to set your goal. And I look back, I say, oh, back then, I only have one restaurant. Roy's open second, open third, John Marie open second, third. I feel like, man, maybe I have to do something. Not that I, it's just like, I feel like, you know, if you're going to be a competitor in the market, you have to be, you have to look at who and how they become. So I said, okay, let's open the second restaurant. I opened Aloha Tower, Chai's Island Bistro. Open another restaurant is you have to, again, time change. If you keep staying what you do, do what you do the same thing 30 years ago, 
That's why you see a lot of shelf kind of disappear. Because if you don't update yourself, you will, you will not become success. It's just a computer. Every time you turn the computer on, they ask you, do you want to update it? Do you want to update it? Because when you update it, <laughs> right, you get all the new things, you get all the new information. In the cooking, the same thing. Your plating has to be different. Your cooking has to be different. You do the same thing, it may success today, 10 years later, people are not going to remember who you are. So I opened my second restaurant, I called Chai's Island Bistro. Since I do an island bistro, the food cannot be Thai anymore, and that's where my fusion food comes. Is I want to do island fusion. I work with a farmer, I work with a grower, and I create my own dish. So I was at Aloha Tower for 14 years. Then I closed because the lease is up, and uh, Hawaii Pacific University bought out the whole mall. Time for me to move to the new location. Now, what I want to do, I can do Chai's Island Bistro, do the same thing, but and then how long it's going to last. So I opened a new location. I said, I want the food to be different. I don't want to do any live music like what I did seven days a week. I look at most of the restaurants. They don't, ambience are not that important for some restaurant. But for me, I want to create an experience. So I work with another designer, and then we design the restaurant together. And I want to take some credit also, because after she worked with us, her, our restaurant, the one that she designed, won International uh, Interior Designer Association. And now she's very busy. After she worked with us, Royce hired her. And she worked with Howard Hughes. And, and it's just like, you know, like, because she's from Thailand, she wants to work with us because I'm from Thai also. And then we kind of work together. And I told her, I want the restaurant not to look Thai, but I want to look modern, contemporary, Asian kind of, but not too much. And that's what we came up when you walk in my restaurant. So that's what I become who I am for. I've been in the restaurant for 31 years. I won. We won Harley Aina Award every single year since we opened, even going to be best catering. We just won the best catering by Honolulu Magazine, Harley Aina this year. We also won best catering by Martha Stewart Wedding. They just named us under the best caterer in, in, in Hawaii. So, and a lot of it is have to do with, I have to say, I thank you so many of you. Many of you come and help me on my catering. Many of you come and help. You know that when I do catering, many of you here, I, I raise my voice because what you do will re reflect who we are, who I am, and what we do. That's what makes one chef different is I can just say, okay, whatever, you can put a little bit more, a little bit less, and let it go, serve it. But how are you going to be success? How are you going to achieve the award that what you want? It not come from just whatever. It has to be perfect. That's why I sometimes I raise my voice. I make my, what I want heard to make sure that things come out the way I want it. Because at the end, it's my name, right? So you have to think the same thing. At the end, when you open your own restaurant, when you become a chef, whatever you do it will reflect who you are and what you will become. So, and, and I thank you for all, all the hard work that everybody come and help me. You know, I have chef, I have student, I have everybody. And, and that's how we achieve successes. We work with all the best people. Me, myself, only can do so far. We need, my team is, Awesome. So, success is come from you, but not from you alone. It's come from people around you. You be the lead, you be the key, you be the vision. Now you have to put your team together. So when you open your own restaurant one day, you will find that challenge, you will find that success, and hopefully, you know, become who you are and what you want to do. Okay? Oh, well, they called me about two months ago. They said, Chef, we wonder would you be interested to do Beat Bobby Flair? 
And for me, I'm in a 30-year business. What can I gain from it? When you lose, it's there forever, right? People will remember. Ask someone that chef in Hawaii and went on and lose and, 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 and... But I take on the challenge because I want to make, I want to show the people that work for me, that work with me, and the students say, you know what? You don't need to concern about, as long, I can know I can do my best. And if I lose, I will pick myself up and then I walk forward because that's all you can do. You don't let what you fail, what your failure pull you back. You just need to move forward. But if I don't do it, it's almost like I play on the safe side. And so far, there are three chefs from Hawaii that went on the show and never win yet. So I want, I want to at least try it. And if I fail, I have to humble myself, right? You have to eat the dirt. <laughs> but if I win, it will be a bragging light for me to, to show people that, you know, you have to take chances sometimes. OK. And uh, this is my sister, Joy. You want to introduce it? Question? Okay. Joy, Joy is uh, my older sister, and uh, she do a lot of fruit carving. She was a chef at Singha, so her, her cooking is, is, she do a lot of Thai cooking. And, uh, and fruit carving. One thing about Thai fruit carving, they, they, they're almost like if I go to any fruit carving competition or whatever, I look at it, I can tell already, are they come from Thailand or they come from China? Uh, 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 China? Because Chinese fruit carving is, is one style, and uh, Thai is one style. So, so this is Joy. She's going to show you how to do a fruit carving. I'm sh I hope that, OK, the camera can catch on, so that's very good. Hello, everyone. Hi. OK. Um, now I'm going to show you how to carve a watermelon. That's going to be look like this one. So in the beginning, when you cut up watermelon, you got to want to pick the one that's very round. The shape that you're looking for, like round and then nice color. And then you cut the bottom, so at least when you're standing it up, it's stable. So in the beginning... May, may I interrupt a little bit? So this is the knife. A knife carving. You cannot use a regular knife and carve it because the knife has to be almost like a hook because that's how you pick all the pieces in the, in, in, in the melon. So you use a regular straight knife, it's not, it doesn't work. So you need, a, a, you need to buy one of these uh, carving knives. Okay. Now, by the way, when I want, I want the top to looking like this one, like a flower, like a leaf shape. So I want every single leaf to be equally. So I start from the middle and then get the section out of it. Just a small line so you, you have idea where you're going to start. And then to the opposite side, the same thing. A little bit section on that. And then you do the same thing on this side. So you divide it into four sections. And then after that, then you divide it again. Depend on how many leaves that you want it to become. If you want like that, I want it like that. So that I would divide this to the other part to be three sections. So it's going to be 12 for all around. This part is the most important of the fruit carving because after you have the top section, the other section of the fruit, you just follow the top. So if you have the top not even, when you're carving, you're going to have a bigger leaf on one side, smaller leaf on the other side. So this is the most important part of the, of the, uh, the, the fruit carving is the top In part. In the beginning part, yeah. yeah. Okay, after that, then I will start to do the leaves. Yeah, I, 
I think a little bit harder to see on camera because of the color. The color in the beginning might be a little bit harder. You start to see the leaf forming. Then I'll go to the second one. Do the same thing again. I will carve it from the, the to get the side, the layout of the leaf, and I will carve the outside. So the leaf which popping out. We'll do the same thing. Okay. Now I want to do the second layer. I will go right underneath the first layer of the leaves and then cut a little bit and then make a deep cut so we see the angle of the, the leaf of the flower. Then I would work my wrist a little bit to create a curving or a sharp edge on the leaves. And then again, I would do the same thing to cutting the bottom so we see the, the loop of the leaves. All I did is just like twist my wrist a little bit to, to get the design that I'm looking for. Okay, now I'm gonna cut to the third layer. Do the same thing. But this time you see the like, color of the watermelon from the inside popping out. Because this is free hand, so when you're carving, you gotta be careful how you, um, you move your knife, because you need a very sharp knife to work with. So when, when you push it too fast or you put it too hard, you might make an accident cutting all the leaves. This is how it look on the second layer and the third layer. And, and from there, it's going to almost like this at the end. She can show you the bigger part, the bigger segment. It's easier to see how. Yes. OK. So from this part, I will go right into this section. Cutting them out a little bit, and then just start to do like the guideline is right here between the leaves of, of both ends. And I just twist my wrist a little bit and then just cut it. So this is it, come, come, come out. And do the same thing for the second one.
as you see, when she carves into the fruit, and this one she kind of zigzag them, so they give a little bit pattern into the fruit. Like this one, it doesn't have that. This melon, it just goes straight one leaf, so you just use straight line. I don't know how to carve the fruit, so I have <laughs> she's the one who, who do all the carving. Okay. This one is almost the same, but this one have the double leaves on it. So I started with this one already, the first one. I'm gonna start with this second one. And the same thing, I would twist my wrist a little bit to get all the design, the zigzag design that you see on the leaves. And then cut on the bottom to get, to get the leaf to pop. And when I need to start on the second layer, I would do the same thing on the second layer. Anybody have any questions so far? I hope you enjoy the fish. As you see, it doesn't take a long time to create something. We do it from scratch. So if, if we have a little bit time, we, we reduce the sauce a little bit more, you get a, a richer flavor, more, a little bit more intense. This is because we only do it right here and serve it to you in 15 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, especially with this technology, you know, for me, I never stop learning how to cook. Every day, I still go on Instagram, I go on Facebook, I look at the, how they play the food, what is hot, what is, what is gonna become the next hot, I, hot item. So Instagram is very, is, is, if you go there, you so many of them, if you just search it, and then if you like something about food, eventually every time you turn it on, it's gonna keep popping up on your screen, and that's what I do, and then and now, some of my food show up on some other el somebody else screen when you hashtag them they hashtag you and that's how you learn all, all the food that how you can visualize how they do it what are the trends that you're seeing in catering whether it's wedding catering or corporate catering the trends in catering is i think I the catering trend is a little bit different the the, the trend on the catering is more of the ambient not so much in the food they just want a good food it doesn't have much trend. The restaurant itself is different because people are more educated and, and, and the millennial is a little bit different than our old generation. So food have to change. To me, I think when I first opened my Singha, my Thai restaurant 30 years ago, everything I did, one thing that I hear the comment is too spicy, too spicy. And that's what people think of Thai food the, the 30 years ago. But believe it or not, nowadays if I use the same food that I serve now, people, no one gonna complain that it's spicy because you already get used to it with it. You know, your, your palate change. And now people looking to do like, they want to eat more exotic. They want a true Korean food, real spicy. They want true Ethiopian food. They want to, now you want, to me, I think the fusion is a little bit faith off or like they're not as big. The traditional cuisine is what gonna become. I think Indian food is, is where gonna become popular in a few years. The, the other thing about Indian food is, it's just like Thai food 30 years ago. Sometimes it can be very powerful because Indian use a lot of spice that when you eat it, it go to your nose. It's like, it just, versus Thai food, it's, it pop in your tongue, in your palate. It's a little bit different. And what are the big challenges of owning your own restaurant or your own operation and catering as well? The more challenge now, is staffing because I think being unemployment in Hawaii is one of the lowest in the nation. 
it's very hard to find a good help and nothing, nothing wrong with your millennial <laughs> but we have a different vision our old generation when we work in one place we don't expect to get advanced right away we pay our deal, we work very hard, we earn it versus millennial because of the technology train you and teach you now you want to know something, you go Google, you find it you want something, you go Google, you find it so a lot of time kids in your generation expect the same in the business I work with a few students they come help me on the catering and then two months later they told me oh chef I just got high I'm executive chef at this restaurant that restaurant and nothing personal at all nothing personal I said how in the right mind people hire them as executive chef when they not have full knowledge yet and sure enough six months later I saw them the restaurant closed or they got let go because knowledge is something that it, just, it doesn't gain overnight you have to keep learning, you have to keep learning, you have to keep learning school only can teach you so much then you have to use your own knowledge, your own interest and build your own cuisine, build your own knowledge, build your own power it's it just, you just, that's why you what makes one restaurant or one chef different than the other is the detail I'm sure every chef when you go to every restaurant some restaurants are better, some are not as good but for the chef itself, they already think that's the best already that's why they send out the food that way so now it's his best and your best who's going to be better right? so it's not about it's, it's about your best and her best who gonna, who's better so now how you're going to become better is now you have to add knowledge to your own you have to keep trying nothing, nothing wrong at all when you fail we all fail it one or another is how you're going to move forward you learn the, the bottom line you learn from the mistake and once you learn from the mistake hopefully you don't do it again I always tell my staff you learn you know the mistake you don't do it again if you know that's a shit, you don't want to step on it right it's the same thing so you make a mistake you don't do it again but sometimes people don't learn they keep making the same mistake they keep making the same mistake making the same mistake and that's when they're not success that's when they're not success because they don't let the mistake teach them or they don't learn from the mistake anything else? if not I want to say thank you to Haley and uh, everybody and Chef Don, Chef Matt and everybody who allow us to come and be a part of you because hopefully we, we you learn something or inspire something and hopefully you become your own restaurant, one, a, a chef one day and you know this is a type of program the Hawaii Culinary Foundation loves to sponsor because Chef Chai epitomizes hard work, professionalism he's a very astute businessman as well as an outstanding chef and shows great care and compassion and attention to detail in running his operation and Joy as you can see the masterful artwork that she's created for all of you today I hope you'll give them both a warm round of applause because it's truly an outstanding program, thank you <laughs>